Okay, folks, I'm going to carry on with uh, the topic of hearing God that we've been looking at. And we've seen that most Christians don't have a problem with talking to God. And uh, often people go to the Lord with all sorts of lists of things that they want. And to them, prayer has become a, a grocery list of telling God what you want. But they neglect to realize that prayer and communication with God is a lot more about hearing God than actually telling him about all the things that you want. We saw a couple of weeks ago that God speaks to us through creation and nature, through his son. He speaks at times with an audible voice. He speaks through his word. He speaks in a small, still inner voice, in our heart and mind. And he speaks through people. And this morning, I want to go on and we'll look at the fact that he speaks through circumstances, through dreams and visions, through angels, through signs and wonders. And he speaks through godly example of others. He also speaks through music. I don't think we'll have time to really get into that. So we can look at that at a later date. But first of all, we saw that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims his handiwork, Psalm 19 verse 1. But we saw, too, that Satan speaks through creation. He says, look around. Everything that you see is an accident. It came from nothing. Uh, there's no designer. You're just a highly evolved animal. And then we saw that God speaks through his son. But we saw, too, that Satan has got a counterfeit. And he's got the Antichrist who's going to be accepted as the Messiah, even by the Jews, in the not-too-distant future. We see that God speaks through our conscience, but we see too that Satan gets people to try and uh, get an opiate for their conscience. And sometimes he provides them with some false religion or some uh, doing good for mankind, save the whales or whatever the case may be. And he presents them with uh, things that are presented as science, which are really just fairy tales. We see, too, that on rare occasions, God speaks with an audible voice, and we looked at a number of those occasions. We see that God speaks through his word, and that always his word must be used as the means by which we judge any other means we feel that we've been spoken to, because God will not speak to us in some way that contradicts his word. And then we saw that Satan even uses the word, that when Jesus resisted the temptation to turn the stones into bread and he used the word to combat satan that satan thought well you know if he's going to use the word let me use the word as well and he tells jesus to jump off the temple uh, because it says in the psalms that he will take give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone but jesus responded again and he says it is also written you shall not tempt the lord your god so satan will use the word of god and sometimes people will try and, you know, argue uh, their point of view, even using God's word, but very often out of context, or they don't know the whole counsel of scripture. We saw too that God speaks through people, and that we need to listen to mature Christian counsel. But now we, oh, we also saw that Satan speaks through people, and that one, of, uh, that one example, that famous example where Peter tries to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. But God speaks to us through circumstances. And sadly, it often takes adverse circumstances to get our attention. And you find people are going through life. And that's why Jesus said it's very difficult for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they see Christianity as just another religion, some crutch for people that need something to get through life because they're poor and there's something wrong with them. And uh, so they don't really need to go, go to God because why do I need to pray for things? I've got everything that I want. And so Jesus said it's more difficult for a rich man to go to heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But... C.S. Lewis, the famous atheist turned Christian, said this, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. God speaks to us in our conscience. 
that shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I have never heard of Daniel Ritchie. I mean, most of us have heard of that net, net, uh, Nick um, chap with no arms and no legs. But uh, I just want to read this little bit here about Daniel Ritchie. He's written a, a book, My Affliction for His Glory. To summarize my story, I stepped into suffering at birth. My physical body is a billboard for pain. This has brought mocking, cruel jokes, stares, and constant feeling that I'm not like everyone else that I meet. I've never been able to hide. Many people can bury their pain, but my heartache is written all over my two empty sleeves. Those sleeves tell a story without my mouth ever saying a word. My pain almost swallowed me, but Christ showed me how much greater he was than my empty sleeves. I used to think that being born without arms was the most horrible thing that could happen to a person. In Christ, he has helped me say that my, the worst and most painful thing that has ever happened to me is also the best thing that has ever happened to me. I'm thankful for my pain. All the frustration that has come with it has reaped a bounty that I could never have produced on my own. God stepped in and carried me along in my weakness, letting me taste his strength, grace, and love in new ways. In my pain, he has magnified so many of his attributes. And we know that not everybody in a wheelchair, not everybody who's disabled turns to God. Many get bitter. Many allow the devil to use that to turn them against God. Um, this chap's a pastor, and as you can see, he's got a wife and two kids. We looked at Nick uh, Vajusic not too long ago, and we saw this guy, motivational speaker, was born to Serbian immigrants in Melbourne in 1982. Throughout his childhood, he was bullied for his tetramelia syndrome, but he became a born-again Christian, and his faith got him through. He believes it was God's plan for him to suffer so that he could inspire others. In 2008, he did his first TV interview, and he has since taken the world by storm, giving speeches and talks all over the planet. And there you can see that uh, he is married, and he's actually got four children. When the world says you're not good enough, get a second opinion, Vajusic told 60 Minutes in an interview. Billy Graham said this, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. And sometimes God uses circumstances to do that. We see that in that famous scripture in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, 15, when Solomon is asking the Lord to listen to the prayers that are offered in the temple that he has just built for the Lord. The Lord says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land. Or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open. And my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. So the Lord makes it quite clear to Solomon that he's going to be listening. And when he brings disaster upon the nation of Israel, because they start worshipping these fallen angels, these gods that the other nations are worshipping, and God punishes them for it, God says, I will hear when you turn to me and cry. And we see how the Jews have gone through terrible suffering because they forget their God. Because after the Tower of Babel, when the nations were uh, divided up amongst these fallen angels, God reserved one nation for himself, and that was Israel. And so he holds them far more accountable than the other nations because they were the people of his first covenant. But as I said, Satan will also use difficult circumstances to discourage people as he did with Job. And we looked at Job in ministry not all that long ago. And we see how when Job suffered and he was afflicted with boils from the head of his, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, it says, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he afflicted Job with painful sores 
from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Now, why did he do this? Because he had tried something else. He had allowed all his sons and daughters to be killed. He had uh, allowed people to come and steal all his uh, cattle and all his herds. And he was left impoverished. And still he didn't curse God. And so Satan said, flesh for flesh, let me allow, allow me to touch him. And the Lord said, okay, you can go and you can touch Job, but you must spare his life. And he not only spared his life, he spared his wife as well, because she served a good purpose. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Then God speaks to us through dreams and visions. At Pentecost, Peter quoted the prophecy in Joel. In Acts 2.17, he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In Genesis 15.1, we see how the Lord appears to Abraham in a vision and says, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Jacob saw a vision with a ladder going up to heaven, with angels going up and down the ladder. Joseph had dreams. Remember, he dreamed about his brothers and his father and uh, them bowing down to him. And he ended up getting thrown in a pit for uh, the fact that he shared this vision with his brothers. Daniel had visions. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Zechariah, just to mention some visions that God spoke to people. We go to the New Testament. We see there that... Uh, God appears to Ananias in a vision. It says in Acts 9, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Paul, uh, Saul. Sorry, He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And why did he lose his sight? Because he had previously on the road had a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And we know how his name was changed to Paul and he became the author of the majority of the New Testament epistles. In Acts 16.9, we see another vision that Paul had. A vision appeared to Paul in the night a man of macedonia was standing appealing to him saying come help come over to macedonia and help us macedonia is one of the bordering territories to greece god even speaks to the unsaved through visions and dreams in genesis 20 it says but god came to abimelech because remember now abraham was being deceitful and he is pretending that Sarah was his sister. He did the same thing with Pharaoh because he didn't want Pharaoh to knock him off and take his uh, wife. So he went there pretending that um, she was his uh, sister. And he does the same thing with Abimelech. So God comes to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you're as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her. So he said, Lord, Will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. We see how God spoke to Pharaoh through dreams. When Joseph was imprisoned and he had interpreted uh, the dreams for the butler and uh, the guy who gave him the wine can't think of what his name is cupbearer there we go okay and these guys so the baker had, had his head chopped off and uh, or he had been hung and uh, the cupbearer had been spared and he went back to his position but he forgot about joseph but what happens is pharaoh has a dream well he actually has two dreams which are pointing to the same thing 
And suddenly the cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison and he is sent to interpret the dreams. It says here in Genesis 41, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. The cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows, and then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain spouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. And so Joseph interprets his dream and tells him you're going to have seven good years, seven years of abundance. And then after that, you're going to have seven years of famine. So Pharaoh then says to him, okay. And he appointed him second to himself. And he, and he gave him charge to gather as much of the grain and that in the seven years of abundance into silos so that when the lean years came, the people could buy it back. And that's what happened. And we know how that's how his brothers who had sold him into slavery eventually came to Egypt and um, they were confronted with this brother of theirs that they didn't recognize that they had done this evil to. We see in Daniel 2 that God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had gone and he had taken uh, uh, Judah captive. I mentioned uh, last week he had taken uh, Jehoiakim and he had uh, first of all, killed all his sons in front of him, and then he gouged his eyes out, and then he took him into slavery, together with a whole lot of other men and uh, women, and uh, including people like Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys grew up under that Babylonian empire. But it says here, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled. He could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me. I want to know what it means. And we know that he wouldn't tell them what the dream was. He says, I'm not going to have you give me some fake interpretation. You're going to actually have to tell me what I dreamed, and then you're going to have to give me the interpretation. And they said, this is impossible. And then somebody mentioned Daniel. And Daniel came in, and he was able to tell the king what he had dreamed and what the dream meant. And that was a prophetic dream showing what was going to come, the nations that would come and that would fall, even up until the time of the Antichrist. We know how we can see that that vision is substantiated by what is mentioned in the book of Revelation. God question says this, and I mean, I've uh, really enjoyed listening to dreams and visions on the audiobooks. And I can't remember how many hundred this guy mentioned of these documented dreams that they have of Muslims that have had dreams of Jesus. But God question says this, there are many reports of Muslims converting to Christianity due to having a dream or experiencing a vision in which Jesus appeared to them. And this is when people are searching, when people are longing for truth, God reveals himself to them. If people are happy with a dead religion, God leaves them. But when people are searching like Abraham, Abraham's father was a moon worshiper. They used to worship the moon in Ur of the Chaldees. And God called Abraham out and he used him in a mighty way. The accounts vary somewhat, but they virtually have all the same following aspects in common. Jesus appears to them. Jesus tells them to find and speak to a person at a certain place at a certain time and some of these are absolutely miraculous where there's this one uh, that i was listening to where there was one single believer in this middle eastern country and god gave this guy the exact address to go to just like he told ananias where to find um saul he said go to straight street and ananias was given the exact address when the Muslim follow, follows Jesus' instructions, he or she finds the person at exactly the right time and place, and the person explains who Jesus truly is and presents the gospel. The Muslim believes that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior and places his or her faith in him, renouncing Islam. But not all dreams and visions are from God. Muhammad had a dream. He believed that he saw the angel Gabriel. 
We know that uh, the Mormons had a dream. I'll touch on that as well. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. Even Israel's spirituality, uh, spiritually blind leaders had dreams. Isaiah 56.10, Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. In some of these dreams and these visions that these Muslims have, the Lord says certain things, which are things that you'll find in Scripture. And then they'll go and they'll, they'll, they'll be confronted with that Scripture by a Christian or somehow the message would come across. And the Lord will confirm the dream with his word. That's why I said God's word will never be contradicted. I like this one. Hey, you don't know me, but God told me in a dream that you're going to be my husband. Okay. I've heard some interesting dreams along those lines as well. I remember one young guy coming to my sister saying that the, the Lord had shown him that he, uh, she was going to be his wife. Fortunately, she didn't uh, feel that that dream was, uh, or vision or revelation was something that she was going to sort of like uh, fulfill. Jeremiah 23, verse 16 to 18 and 28. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to those who follow the stubbornness of their own hearts, they say no harm will come to you. But, to which, but which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream. But let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What a straw have in common with grain. So the Lord refers to their dreams as straw. And there are Christians who come with straw, with nonsense, with rubbish, with some figment of their imagination, and pass it off as a dream or a vision. God speaks to us through angels. In Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, it says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and Gavin has mentioned this with regards to his ministry on covenant, that somehow there was angelic involvement in the establishing of the first covenant. And every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Manoah, Samson's father, prayed this. In Judges 13, then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again and teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Because they had seen, and often these angels do appear in human form. That's the difference between an angel and between a demon. An angel can take on human form. A demon wants to possess a body, and so demons look around for people to possess, whereas angels can themselves materialize as humans. And this angel had come and had told them that they were going to have a son, and that he was to keep the Nazarite vows, and that he was going to be a judge over Israel. In Luke 1, 11 to 13, we see Zechariah is spoken to by an angel who tells him that he is going to uh, be a father, that his wife's going to be a child, John the Baptist, who is going to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And because he doubted, Zechariah, uh, because he doubted uh, uh, the angel, I think it was Gabriel, um, he was struck dumb. And he only had uh, his speech given back to him when the baby was born and he was able to confirm the name, John, for the son. We see in Luke 2, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And glory of the Lord shone around and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. 
I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Daniel was um, confronted with an angel, and here it makes it quite clear that he was obviously having visions. So it could be that an angel materializes like it happened with the shepherds and like it happened um, with uh, the first one that we looked at with Zechariah. But um, yeah, we see it's in a vision that he sees Gabriel. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me in, the swift, in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And we know that there were a number of occasions like that with Daniel. Joseph, the father of Jesus, was warned and directed by an angel in a vision. He was actually even told to marry Mary when he wanted a divorce and put Mary away because he found out she was pregnant. And the angel said, no, this is of the Holy Spirit. But yeah, he's told to get away from Herod because Herod's going to kill all the babies under two years old in Bethlehem. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord then appears to him and tells him he can come back again because obviously the Herod who had been responsible for that had died, but he is too scared to go back to Bethlehem. So he goes to Nazareth. But even in that, it's prophecy being fulfilled. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to it in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. But Satan also speaks through angels. The angel Moroni Okay, I won't comment on that name. It looks similar to something else. He's an angel whom Joseph Smith reported as having visited him on numerous occasions, beginning on September 21, 1823. According to Smith, the angel was the guardian of the golden plates buried in the hill of Kumura near Smith's home in western New York. Latter day Saints, or what we know as Mormons, believe the plates were the source material for the Book of Mormon. What, do, what does Paul say? Paul says this in Galatians 1 verse 6 to 8. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be under God's curse. Remember that one third of the angels, of angels that have rebelled against God, that are going to be cast down to the earth during the time of the tribulation, one of the worst things about the time of the tribulation when the Christians are raptured is these beings are going to be walking down on earth. It's not going to just be the Antichrist that you're going to have to contend with. It's going to be these fallen beings. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 15. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And we have that today. We see them on TV. Satan doesn't come to you with a red suit and a fork and tail. He comes to you as an angel. No wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. God speaks to us through signs and wonders. 
In Hebrews 2, 1 and 4, we looked at this early on. We're just going to carry on with the verse. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience met its, uh, received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. In Matthew 11, verse 22, 24, it says, Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Remember when uh, the rich man was in hell and he looked over and he saw Lazarus in paradise, in Abraham's bosom. He said to the Lord, uh, please, won't you, he say, sorry, he says to Abraham, please, won't you let uh, Lazarus go back? and warn my family about this terrible place? And the answer was, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe them, they will not believe if someone rise from the dead. And folks, we saw that with the other Lazarus. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. He died. Jesus rose him, uh, raised him from the dead four days later, and the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Because many people were believing on Jesus because of the miracles. They didn't say, hey, we're wrong. They said, no, this guy's like embarrassing us. He's like uh, embarrassing our doctrine. Let's kill him. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And there you can see Capernaum, uh, where we went when we went on our trips uh, to Israel, is right on the Sea of Galilee. But just above it, a little bit inland, you see Chorazin, and then you see to the right of that Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a small town in Galilee, best known in the Bible as the birthplace of three of Jesus' disciples, Philip, Peter, and Andrew. Some scholars suggest that there are two towns called Bethsaida during the time of Jesus, as two cities having the same or similar name were common in those days. The Bethsaida most often referred to in Scripture was located near the Jordan River, uh, where the Jordan River flows into the Sea of Galilee on the north side of the sea. Bethsaida was the scene of several miracles. Enough, this is from God Questions, enough that Jesus could say, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Bethsaida has come to represent those who have heard the gospel, understood God's plan of salvation, and rejected it. Jesus implied that their eternal punishment would be harsher than those who did not have such a privilege. One of the miracles performed in Bethsaida was the restoration of sight to a blind man. And remember, there was that one occasion when Jesus uh, healed a blind man, and the, the question was presented to the leaders, has anyone ever healed and restored the sight of the blind? It is likely that the feeding of the 5,000 took place near Bethsaida. It was also the site of one of Jesus' most famous miracles, walking on water. He sent his disciples on ahead on the Sea of Galilee towards Bethsaida while he spent some time in prayer. Late that night, a strong wind made rowing the boat difficult. In the midst of the disciples' efforts to keep the boat afloat, they saw a figure coming to them on top of the waves. They were terrified until Jesus got in the boat with them and the waves instantly calmed. It was on its way to Bethsaida that Jesus walked on the water. It goes on to say in Matthew 11, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will descend down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, 
it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Sodom, we know, was destroyed with fire from heaven as God rained down fire from heaven on them. Capernaum was a city located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. It is significant in Scripture because Capernaum was the chosen home city of Jesus after he was driven from Nazareth by religious officials. So Jesus spent most of his ministry in Capernaum. Capernaum was also home of Peter and Andrew, where Jesus called them to follow him. Jesus also found Matthew, a tax collector in Capernaum, and called him to follow him. Jesus referred to Capernaum often and did many of his miracles there. He also taught in the synagogue. Although Capernaum had been the site of so many proofs of Jesus' identity, the people there refused to believe. And he included it in the denunciation of several cities. You, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to heaven? No, you will descend. You will go down to Hades. It was in Capernaum that Jesus healed the centurion's son, the nobleman's son, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and the paralytic. In Capernaum, Jesus cast out an unclean spirit, and he raised Jairus' daughter to life. Miracles, things that had never, ever been performed before, raising the dead to life, and healed the woman with the bleeding issue. That's why he said, if the miracles had been done in you, that were done in you, had been done in Sodom, they would have repented. But you didn't repent. That's why Jesus said, you will come one day and you'll say, Lord, you taught in our streets. You lived in Capernaum. And he will say, depart from me. I do not know you. The city of Capernaum represents many who have been exposed to the gospel, may enjoy going to church, and consider themselves Christians by association. The familiarity with Jesus and his word gives them a false sense of assurance that they are right with God, when in reality, Jesus will one day say to them, away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. The people of Capernaum heard what Jesus did and said, yet they refused to believe. But Satan can also deceive us through signs and wonders. In Exodus, we know how Pharaoh calls in his magicians to duplicate the things that Moses is doing. It says, so Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one of them threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up the staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them. We know how God went on to perform the ten plagues and he embarrassed their gods. They used to worship the river Nile and God turned the river into blood. They used to worship the sun, and God darkened the sun. There was no sunlight. So he embarrassed them by all these things that they worshipped, by showing these people that he is far more powerful, that the one that they worship, who presents all these false signs and wonders, he himself is a created being. But God allows him to do this so that he can deceive people whose hearts are evil who are not interested in following God. He says the Jews look for a sign, the Greeks look for wisdom. But God comes with a message that's foolish. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. 
And so all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So if people choose the darkness, if they choose evil, God allows them to become deceived and to become delusioned. And that's why we're going to have a world in the not too distant future that is ruled by Satan himself with his proxy, the Antichrist. God speaks to us through the godly examples of others. In Matthew 5, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is attributed to Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. But we've seen when we did evangelism that when it comes to the gospel, words are necessary. But our words must be backed up by our lives. But you don't just win somebody to Christ just by being an example. It's a door opener. Wives been a godly example to unsaved husbands. In 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2, it says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So God speaks through godly examples. And there are numerous accounts that I've uh, come across where people believe because they see Jesus lived out in someone's life. 1 Peter 2 says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority because they're there, because God's put them there. So just because the government doesn't believe in God doesn't mean you can just ignore them. We need to submit to authority and we need to respect authority. We don't always have to obey it. But submission is unconditional. Obedience is conditional. A wife who is in submission to her husband can disobey him if he tells her not to go to church, not to serve the Lord. So always submit, but don't always obey. Okay, you obey when it fits in line with when it doesn't contradict the word of God. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. But Satan also uses bad examples to put people of Christianity. I like this one. Of course, I'm a Christian. I also cheat. I lie. I cheat. I gossip. And I live in a totally selfish way. But Romans 2, 21 to 24 says, you then who teach others, do you teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And we know of numerous accounts where people have brought shame on the name of the Lord, brought disgrace on the name of Christians and the church and on God by preaching one thing and living another. And then lastly, and I'm not going to go into this, no one, um, God speaks to us through music. No one can come to the Father unless no one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws me. Drawing near to God is not something we initiate. It is responding to God drawing us. 
So when it says draw near to God, it's because God is drawing you. Don't harden your heart. Allow God to draw you. Two biblical ways to respond or open the door is through praise and prayer. Psalm 22.3, the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. But Satan also uses music to spread his message. Music has long been associated with the devil. Hell and the endless hordes of hellish minions that live there. And Gavin has ministered how they try and take out of one verse of scripture in Ezekiel, uh, something that's supposed to mean that Satan was in charge of music in heaven. That's nonsense. But Satan uses this powerful weapon. And folks, you can see, if you look in the world today, you can see people who have been mightily used by God in music ministry. You can look at the world and you can see people that have been mightily used by the devil to spread his nonsense. Now, while many musicians and acts have claimed to be in league with the Dark Lord in the past, only one has the dubious honor of co-writing a song with Lucifer himself, Giuseppe Tartini. And he wrote uh, a composition which is known as the Devil's Pull. And that's back in the 1700s, where he said he had this vision where the devil actually sat on the bottom of his bed. And he gave his violin to the devil and asked him to play him a song. And he says that this song, which is very acclaimed and very, very complicated on the violin, he said, isn't anything compared to what the devil played to him. It's just a tribute of what he could remember because he got down and he wrote down certain things after he had this wonderful vision. Okay, so I want to just challenge you folks to remember that God speaks to us, that he's given us his word as our safeguard against, uh, against being deceived. But we need to obey him. We need to do what he says so that he can carry on speaking to us.